This is Audible. The Druids, the History and Mystery of the Ancient Celtic Priests Written by Charles River Editors, Jesse Haraster Narrated by Philip J. Mather Contents Introduction Chapter 1 Early Origins of the Celts Chapter 2 Ancient Accounts of the Druids Chapter 3 The Archaeological Record Chapter 4 The Last Survivors Chapter 5 The Druids' Connections to Ancient Celtic Myths and Legends Chapter 6 A Modern Revival Introduction Throughout all of Gaul there are two classes of people who are treated with dignity and honour. This does not include the common people who are little better than slaves and never have a voice in councils. Many of these align themselves with a patron voluntarily, whether because of debt or heavy tribute or out of fear of retribution by some other powerful person. Once they do this, they have given up all rights and are scarcely better than servants. The two powerful classes mentioned above are the Druids and the Warriors. Druids are concerned with religious matters, public and private sacrifices, and divination. Julius Caesar The Celts are one of the most well-known groups in Europe and one of the least understood. Depending on which classifications are used, the Celts are also one of the oldest civilizations in Europe. In the centuries before Christ, the Celts were spread out across much of continental Europe, and though they are mostly identified with Gaul, evidence suggests they also spread as far as Portugal. However, even though they were spread out across Europe before the height of the Roman Empire, most people associate the Celts with the British Isles today, particularly Ireland and Scotland. After they had been relegated to those smaller regions as a result of the Romans and other migrations, the culture of the Celts as it is currently understood began to congeal during the early Middle Ages, and Celtic culture, folklore and legend have all become inextricably intertwined with Irish history and British history as a whole. The Celts have fascinated people for centuries, and the biggest fascination of all has been over the Druids, a religious class at the heart of Celtic society that wielded great power. Naturally, people have been interested in Druids for centuries, mostly because they don't understand much about the Druids or their practices. The earliest meaning of the word comes from the ancient Romans, who labelled them Druidae, in reference to the white-robed order of Celtic priests living in Gaul, Britain, and Ireland. They were a well-organised, secretive group who kept no written records and performed their rituals, allegedly including human sacrifice, in oaken groves, all of which interested and horrified Roman writers. As Pliny wrote in the first century AD, Barbarous rites were found in Gaul, even within my own memory, for it was then that the Emperor Tiberius passed a decree through the Senate outlawing their druids and their types of diviners and physicians. But why do I mention this about a practice which has crossed the sea and reached the ends of the earth? For even today, Britain performs rites with such ceremony that you would think they were the source for the extravagant Persians. It is amazing how distant people are so similar in such practices. But at least we can be glad that the Romans have wiped out the murderous cult of the Druids, who thought human sacrifice and ritual cannibalism were the greatest kind of piety. The order was eventually crushed under the weight of first Roman conquest and then the imposition of Christianity, and from the remains centuries of myths, imaginings, and dreams were superimposed over that little that was known about the Druids. Not surprisingly, people have come to associate the Druids with what has been imposed. Even today, there is a revived Druidic religious movement that fuses this skeleton of knowledge about the ancient Druids with the ideas such as rituals at standing stones, like Stonehenge, nature and sun worship, the carrying of ornate staves, and Arthuriana. Wider popular culture has seen Druids, usually some sort of secretive nature priests in games like Dungeons and Dragons and World of Warcraft, and films like Wicker Man, 1973 and 2006, and Druids, 2001. Chapter 1. Early Origins of the Celts 
For decades, scholars, linguists, and archaeologists have sought to fuse information culled from the surviving Celtic languages, the physical remains of the past, and historic documents to reconstruct the lives and histories of the various Celtic peoples. The historical search begins by examining language. While people often think of language as constantly changing, with new slang words appearing seemingly by the day, there are many elements of language that are quite conservative and slow to change. These parts include pronunciation, grammar, and basic core vocabulary, like pronouns, parts of the body, and family relations. Basic core vocabulary changes so slowly that linguists can use it to compare and contrast languages and look for ancient links between them. Because changes to these words accumulate not only slowly, but also at a relatively regular rate, linguists can compare two branches of a related language tree, like Italian and Spanish, and estimate at what point the two languages diverged from one another. This is a rough estimate, but for particularly ancient divisions before the invention of writing, it is often the best date available. This process is known as glottochronology. Almost all European, Iranian, and Indian languages descend from a single language called Proto-Indo-European. For example, linguists have attempted to reconstruct Proto-Indo-European, Pi, and by using some clever comparison and backtracking, they have argued that the concept of the word around was originally spoken in Pi as something like Ambi. Linguists have found Gaulish examples from modern-day France and Celto-Iberian from modern-day Spain that use the term ambi almost identically. In the contemporary Old Irish, which also has written examples, linguists have found the use of im and the use of am in Middle Welsh. This pattern also continued into the present day. In modern Scots Gaelic, im, in Welsh, am, em or im, in Breton, am or em. And in Cornish, am, yim, om, or em, it is apparent that the terms resemble each other and that their variations have slowly shifted over time. There are considerable debates amongst linguists as to when and where Proto-Indo-European emerged and began to break into today's language families, with some arguing modern-day Turkey around 8,700 years ago, and others the southern Russian steppes around 6,000 years ago. Regardless, the language communities that would eventually speak Celtic broke from this mother tongue many thousands of years ago and moved westward into what is now Central Europe, where the language emerged into a form that is recognized as distinctly Celtic. Within the language family, recent research indicates that the northern Goedelic Celtic languages, Irish, Scots Gaelic and Manx, broke off from the southern Brythonic languages, Welsh, Cornish and Breton, around 1100 BC. The continental Celtic, usually referred to as the extinct language of Gaulish, separated from the Brythonic languages around 1000 BC. The splintering of these subfamilies into the named languages of today happened relatively recently, with the Brythonic languages separating in the 9th century AD and the Goedelic in the 8th century AD. The techniques of historical linguists, including glottochronology, provide the necessary evidence to link the ancient Celts to various time periods. Because much of modern archaeology works to provide links between archaeological discoveries and particular times, linguistic information allows researchers to go one step further and associate a language with archaeological remains as well. If this sounds complex, that's because it is. This task is riddled with the potential for mistakes, and the archaeology of Celtic remains is often a very controversial subject. As a result, in some cases the word Celt has been removed and replaced with more neutral terms like Iron Age peoples, to the consternation of many Celtic nationalists. However, the fact that the Celtic languages exist today means that they have existed throughout history, and with them Celtic peoples. In other words, archaeological studies of the Celts are not impossible, but merely difficult. And as techniques have become far more refined in recent years, they have provided an increasingly clear picture of the past. Due to ancient accounts, there has long been a debate over the location and origins of the first Celts. Roman writers like Julius Caesar used the term Celts to refer to people who the Romans came into contact with in France, while ancient Greek historian Herodotus suggested the Celts were originally near the Rhine River. 
Today, the first group that archaeologists tentatively connect to the Celts is a cultural group called the Urnfield culture, which existed primarily in today's eastern and southern France and western Germany. They were known for their cremated burials in urns and were considered to be a Bronze Age people, since they used metal tools constructed of bronze, a mixture of copper and tin, and practiced agriculture. The Bronze Age is typically associated with the classic dynastic Egypt, the empires of Sumer and Babylonia in today's Iraq, the pre-classic Greece of Homer and the Minoan civilization of the island of Crete. The Urnfield people existed from around 1300 to 750 BC and were expansionist, clearly relying on their impressive hill forts. The division of the main branches of the Celtic languages, set around 1100 BC, occurred in this period and may be linked to a series of events around 1200 to 1100 BC that are known as the Bronze Age Collapse. This mysterious time was a period of massive social upheaval, population movements and societal collapse throughout the Mediterranean, including the collapse of the Hittite Empire and the Egyptian New Kingdom. The Bronze Age collapse had repercussions throughout Europe, especially if the cause, as some believe, was due to climate change. Collapses aside, culture change and the archaeological record tends to be a slow process, as one culture slowly gives way to another. Eventually, the Anfield people were replaced by a set of cultural remains that archaeologists refer to as the Halstead culture, which thrived from around 900 to 600 BC. This was probably not an actual replacement of one group of people by another, but an evolution of technology and traditions that saw the old ways remain at the peripheries long after the wealthy areas converted to the new forms. The most noticeable addition was the use of iron tools, which means the Hallstatt are an Iron Age people. Archaeologists believe that despite a similarity in technology, there are enough differences between the eastern and western branches of the Hallstatt to distinguish them from each other. The eastern branch resided in today's Czech and Slovak republics, parts of the northern former Yugoslavia and parts of Hungary and Austria, while the western branch was in northern France, parts of northern Switzerland, Bavaria, northern Italy and the northern parts of Spain and Portugal. The western branch is typically associated with the Celtic peoples, while the east is associated with another Indo-European group called the Illyrians. In the west, the people used and were even occasionally buried with mighty chariots, and they built hilltop forts like their predecessors. While the easterners began to trade with Greece early, the western, presumably Celtic, Hallstatt people only came into regular contact with the Mediterranean trade routes after 600 BC. This is important for two reasons. The first is that the control of luxury goods from these areas was apparently a key element in the rise of more centralized government, which are now called chiefdoms. Second, it was these Mediterranean peoples who possessed writing, and thus began to document the existence of the peoples related to the ancient Celts. Entering the 5th century BC, scholars are able to draw more concrete connections between people, place, and language based on all three forms of documentation, linguistic analysis of language fragments, archaeology of sites, and the written records of ancient observers, most importantly the Romans. The group that emerged out of the Hallstatt people, known in archaeological circles as Latin culture, has been directly linked to the Celts of Roman history. This was perhaps the golden age of the Celtic peoples, who were at the height of their military power and artistic endeavours, and were spread out as far as they ever would. The heartland of their influence was in what is now France and southern Germany, where they were referred to as Gauls, and their language was called Gaulish. In Spain they were known as the Celtiberians, after they arrived during the twilight of the Hallstatt period, the 6th and 7th centuries BC, and occupied the Ebro Valley in the northeastern area of Spain. The Celtiberians were documented by Roman writers like the geographer Strabo, who noted that they were known to the classical Greeks. It is also believed that Herodotus was referring to the Celtiberians when he talked about the Celts living beyond the Pillars of Hercules. The 4th century BC Greek poet Ephorus wrote that they had the same customs as the Greeks. It was likely the Greeks who first labelled people Celts, and their other references to Iberians led to the compounding of the names into Celtiberians, thus ignorantly uniting various distinct nations. 
The Romans didn't make much of a distinction either, though Strabo did note differences between the peoples in Germany and the Iberian Peninsula, writing, Now the parts beyond the Renus, immediately after the country of the Celti, slope towards the east and are occupied by the Germans, who, though they vary slightly from the Celtic stock in that they are wilder, taller, and have yellower hair, are in all other respects similar, for in build, habits, and modes of life they are such as I have said the Celti are. And I also think that it was for this reason that the Romans assigned them to the name Germani, as though they wished to indicate thereby that they were genuine Galatae. For in the language of the Romans, Germani means genuine. The Celts were drawn further into the Mediterranean world by allying themselves with the Carthaginians in the Punic Wars, which is not altogether surprising since Hannibal and his father had established Carthaginian power in southern Spain. However, it proved to be a big mistake after Carthage's total defeat at the hands of the Romans. Naturally, the Romans had little sympathy for the Celtiberians as they moved to dominate the Iberian Peninsula. Strabo, an important Greek historian and a geographer, wrote in his seminal Geography, As for Iberia, the Romans did not stop reducing it by force of arms until they had subdued the whole of it, first by driving out the Nomentini, and later on by destroying Viriathus and Suetonius and, last of all, the Cantabri, who were subdued by Augustus Caesar. As for Celtica, both the Cisalpine and the Transalpine, together with Liguria, the Romans at first brought it over to their side only part by part, from time to time. But later the deified Caesar, and afterwards Caesar Augustus, acquired it all at once in a general war. But at the present time the Romans are carrying on war against the Germans, setting out from the Celtic regions as the most appropriate base of operations, and have already glorified the fatherland with some triumphs over them. The greater concentration of Celts was, however, further north in today's France. These Gauls developed the art style that is known throughout the world as Celtic, curvilinear S-shaped designs with complex symmetrical geometric patterns. Some surviving pieces include the bronze Battersea Shield, the Waterloo Helmet, and the Wandsworth Shield, all kept at the British Museum in London. The Celts of this period were known for their aristocratic warrior class, which rode to battle in chariots wearing spectacular armour. With that said, their territories, which stretched from the British Islands through France and Germany, east into the Czech Republic and south into Switzerland and even Italy, were never politically united, and it is unclear whether they had a single ethnic identity. While there were certainly artistic and linguistic links, they were divided into dozens of warring chiefdoms. Moreover, while they were called Celts by the Romans, they probably did not think of themselves using those terms. The Roman writer Diodorus Siculus, who lived during the mid-first century BC, described the inhabitants of Gaul in detail, and the Romans knew them all too well as a result of Julius Caesar's campaigns in Gaul. Diodorus wrote, The Gauls are tall of body, with rippling muscles and white of skin. Their hair is blonde, and not only naturally so, but they also make it their practice by artificial means, to increase the colour which nature has given it, for they are always washing their hair in lime water, and they pull it back from the forehead and back to the nape of the neck, with the result that their appearance is like that of satires and pans, since the treatment of their hair makes it so heavy and coarse that it differs in no respect from a horse's mane. Some of them shave the beard, but others let it grow a little. The nobles shave their cheeks, but they let their moustaches grow until it covers the mouth. Consequently, when they are eating, their moustaches become entangled in the food, and when they are drinking, the beverage passes, as it were, through a kind of strainer. When they dine, they all sit, not upon chairs, but on the ground, using for cushions the skins of wolves or dogs. The service at the meals is performed by the youngest children, both male and female, who are of suitable age, and near at hand are fireplaces heaped with coals, and on them are cauldrons and spits holding whole pieces of meat. Brave warriors are rewarded with the choicest portions of the meat. It is their custom, even in the course of a meal, to seize upon any trivial matter as an occasion for keen argument, and then to challenge the other to single combat without any regard for their lives. In their journeys, and when they go into battle, the Gauls use chariots drawn by two horses, which carry the charioteer and the warrior. When they encounter cavalry in the fighting, they first hurl their javelins at the enemy, and then step down from the chariots to join battle with their swords. 
Certain of them despise death to such a degree that they enter the perils of battle without protective armor and with no more than a girdle about their loins. They also bring to the battle their free men to serve them, choosing them out from among the poor, and these attendants they use in battle as charioteers and shield-bearers. It is also their custom, when they are drawn up for battle, to step out in front of the line and to challenge the most valiant men among their opponents to single combat, brandishing their weapons in front of them to terrify their adversaries. And when any man accepts the challenge to battle, they break forth into a song in praise of the valiant deeds of their ancestors and in boast of their own high achievements, reviling all the while and belittling their opponent, trying, in a word, by such talk to strip him of his bold spirit before the combat. When their enemies fall, they cut off their heads and fasten them about the necks of their horses, and turning over to their attendants the arms of their opponents all covered with blood, they carry them off as booty, singing a song of thanksgiving over them. These first fruits of battle they fasten by nails in their houses, just as men do in certain kinds of hunting with the heads of wild beasts they have killed. The heads of their most distinguished enemies they embalm in cedar oil and carefully preserve in a chest and these they exhibit to strangers, gravely maintaining that in exchange for this head one of their ancestors, or their father, or they themselves, refuse the offer of a great sum of money. And some men among them, we are told, boast that they have not accepted an equal weight of gold for the head they show, displaying a barbarous sort of greatness of soul, for not to sell that which constitutes a witness and proof of one's valour is a noble thing. The clothing they wear is striking, shirts which have been dyed and embroidered in varied colours, and breeches which in their tongue they call brachae. They wear striped coats, fastened by a buckle on their shoulder, heavy for winter wear and light for summer, in which are set checks, close together and of varied hues. For armour they use long shields, as high as a man, which are made in a manner peculiar to them, some of them having the figures of animals embossed on them in bronze and these are skilfully worked with an eye not only to beauty but also to protection. On their heads they put bronze helmets, which have large embossed figures standing out from them, and give an appearance of great size to those who wear them. In some cases horns are attached to the helmet so as to form a single piece. In other cases images of the foreparts of birds or four-footed animals. Their trumpets are of a peculiar nature and such as barbarians use, for when they are blown they yield a harsh sound appropriate to the tumult of war. Some of them have iron breastplates, but others are satisfied with the armor which nature has given them, and they go into battle naked. In place of the short sword they carry long broadswords, which are of iron or bronze, and are worn on the right side. The Gauls are terrifying in aspect, and their voices are deep and harsh. When they meet, they converse with few words and in riddles, for the most part hinting darkly at things, and using one word where they mean another. Also, they like to talk in superlatives, to the end that they might extol themselves and belittle all others. They are also boasters and threateners, and are fond of pompous language, and yet have sharp wits, and are not without cleverness at learning. Among them are also to be found lyric poets, whom they call bards. These men sing to the accompaniment of instruments much like lyres, and their songs are either of praise or of satire. Philosophers, as we would call them, and men learned in religious matters are unusually honoured among them, and are called druids by them. The Gauls likewise make use of diviners, accounting them worthy of high regard, and these men foretell the future by means of the flight or cries of birds, and of the slaughter of sacred animals and they have the people subservient to them. They also observe a custom which is especially astonishing when they are consulting about matters of great importance. In such cases they devote to death a human being and plunge a dagger into him in the region above the diaphragm, and when the stricken victim has fallen they read the future from the manner of his fall and from the twitching of his limbs, as well as from the gushing of his blood having learned to place confidence in an ancient and long-established practice of observing such matters. And it is a custom of theirs that no one should perform a sacrifice without a philosopher, for, they say, offerings should be rendered to the gods by those experienced in the nature of the divine and who speak the language of the gods. It is also through the mediation of such men, they think, that blessings should be sought.
Nor is it only in times of peace, but in wartime as well, that they obey these men and the chanting poets, and such obedience is observed not only by their friends, but also by their enemies. Many times, for instance, when two armies approach each other in battle with swords drawn and spears thrust forward, these men step between them and make them stop, as though having cast a spell over wild beasts. They cut off the heads of enemies slain in battle and attach them to the necks of their horses. The blood-stained spoils they hand over to their attendants and strike up a pan and sing a song of victory, and they nail up these first fruits upon their houses, just as do those who lay low wild animals in certain kinds of hunting. They embalm in cedar oil the heads of the most distinguished enemies and preserve them carefully in a chest and display them with pride to strangers, saying that for this head one of their ancestors, or his father, or the man himself, refused the offer of a large sum of money. They say that some of them boast that they refused the weight of the head in gold. Despite their divisions, the Celtic leaders were able to mend highly effective military campaigns from their rich heartlands, moving out into Italy and the Balkans in the 3rd and 4th centuries BC, and reaching as far as modern-day Turkey. Celtic soldiers even sacked the city of Rome in 390 BC. This expansionism was not due to an inherent warlike or emotional nature, but to the fact that chiefdom government structures like theirs rewarded conquest as a path for self-promotion. In many ways their government and social structures were similar to those found around the Mediterranean world in the centuries before the Roman Empire, only that the Celts were particularly effective at utilizing those structures for their own benefit. Much of what is known about the continent Celts in this period comes from surviving writings, in particular those of the Romans and Greeks who fought against the Celts throughout that era. Of course, much of the writing takes on the tone of propaganda and is laden with descriptions of drunken, barbaric Celts without the marks of civilization that the Romans and Greeks saw in themselves. Reading about a culture from its enemies is always a tricky business, but after the Roman Empire conquered Gaul and Iberia by the 1st century AD, the Gaulish or Gallic Celts were integrated en masse into Roman culture. While the French state classically likes to refer to our ancestors the Gauls in the 19th century, little remains of their language or culture in contemporary France, even though a shared Celtic past remains a symbolically potent idea. Chapter 2. Ancient Accounts of the Druids People love reading about the Druids, yet many would have a hard time even defining them, and there is even considerable debate about the etymology of the word Druid. The first steps of this word are relatively clear. Druid in English comes from Druid in French, perhaps in the 1560s, and this comes from the Latin Druidae, which was the term used by the ancient Roman chroniclers. However, the more interesting and useful question is, what is the origin of the term in Latin? Did the chroniclers invent the word, or was it borrowed from some Gaulish or other Celtic terminology? If the latter is true, then understanding the origins of Druidi may explain how the ancient Celts saw their religious leaders. In much the same way, insights can be gained from analyzing the Christian title pastor, which is drawn from the term for someone who cares for a flock of animals, and says something about the ways that early Christians viewed their spiritual leaders. Unfortunately, the modern Celtic languages do not provide much help, because their terms for druids are typically borrowed from English, as with the Cornish word druith, druidion for the plural. However, for over a century, scholars have examined the extant Celtic tongues and compared them to the written fragments of earlier incarnations to attempt to reconstruct a language they called Old Celtic. And by examining the hypothetical words of Old Celtic, for which there are no written records, scholars can propose theories of the origins of words like Druidae. One of the most convincing of these arguments is that the word was Druids in Gaulish, which was the language of the Celts who fought against the Roman chroniclers, and that it in turn came from a hypothetical old Celtic word, Derwiges. This would have come from Dru, which meant tree or oak, and Wid, which meant to know or to have a vision. This would mean that the roots would be something akin to those who know the oak. Interestingly, the old Celtic word derwos also meant truth, a double meaning that was probably not lost on the Celts. There is one other potential origin of the term worth noting. The Celtic languages are divided into two large groups. 
the Brythonic, including today's Welsh, Breton, and Cornish, and historical Gaulish and British, and Goadoic, including today's Irish, Scots Gaelic, and Manx, and the historical languages of Ireland. The term Dowages is derived from the Brythonic side of the language family, which makes sense considering that the Romans primarily encountered speakers of Brythonic languages in Gaul and Britain. However, in the contemporary Irish and Scots languages, the term Dreoi comes from Druid, which means a magician or sorcerer. This comes from an old Irish term, Druid, with the same meaning. What gives this argument some plausibility that the first one does not have is that the words Drei and Dryad and Drui can all be found in either modern spoken language or in written records, not merely through hypothetical reconstruction. Thankfully, there are plenty of ancient sources of information documenting the existence of the Druids, and there is also archaeological evidence. It is from the written records, specifically the writings of Roman chroniclers, that people first learned about the Druids, and ultimately it is from these important but questionable sources that scholars have the only confirmed evidence about the beliefs and practices of the ancient Druids. Even before the rise of the Roman Empire, ancient historians described the Celts and some of their rituals. According to the ancient Greek historian Athenaeus in the 4th century BC, Sopater noted, among them is the custom, whenever they are victorious in battle, to sacrifice their prisoners to the gods. So I, like the Celts, have vowed to the divine powers to burn those three false dialecticians as an offering. In the early 3rd century BC, Timaeus wrote, Historians point out that the Celts who live on the shore of the ocean honor the Diasauri above other gods, for there is an ancient tradition among them that these gods came to them from the ocean. Another Greek historian noted their use of sacrifices. Eudoxus says that the Celts do the following, and if anyone thinks his account credible, let him believe it. If not, let him ignore it. When clouds of locusts invade their country and damage the crops, the Celts evoke certain prayers and offer sacrifices which charm birds, and the birds hear these prayers, come in flocks, and destroy the locusts. If, however, one of them should capture one of these birds, his punishment, according to the lords of the country, is death. If he is pardoned and released, this throws the birds into a rage, and to revenge the captured bird, they do not respond if they are called on again. Strabo noted a similar anecdote. The following story which Artemidorus has told about the crows is unbelievable. There is a certain harbour on the coast which, according to him, is named Two Crows. In this harbour are seen two crows, with their right wings somewhat white. Men who are in dispute about certain matters come here, put a plank on an elevated place, and then each man separately throws up cakes of barley. The birds fly up and eat some of the cakes, but scatter others. The man whose cakes are scattered wins the dispute. Although this story is implausible, his report about the goddess Demeter and Kor is more credible. He says that there is an island near Britain on which sacrifices are performed, like those in Samothrace for Demeter and Kor. Ultimately, the most concrete descriptions of the Druids came from several Roman writers, who offer tantalizing glimpses into the long religious and ritual world of the Druids, and overwhelmingly demonstrate the social power that the Druids had, and the ways that the Romans seemed to often hold them in awe as well. Perhaps the most detailed discussion of the Druids and their ways comes from Julius Caesar's Notebooks about the Gallic War, written sometime in the 50s or 40s BC. He discusses Celtic society and the Druids at length. Throughout Gaul there are two classes of persons of definite account and dignity. Of the two classes above mentioned, one consists of Druids, the other of knights. The former are concerned with divine worship, the due performance of sacrifices, public and private, and the interpretation of ritual questions. A great many young men come to the Druids for instruction, holding them in great respect. Indeed, the Druids are the judges on all controversies, public and private. If any crime has been committed, if any murder done, if there are any questions concerning inheritance, or any controversy concerning boundaries, the Druids decide the case and determine punishments. If anyone ignores their decision, that person is banned from all sacrifices, an extremely harsh punishment among the Gauls. Those who are so condemned are considered detestable criminals. Everyone shuns them, 
and will not speak with them, fearing some harm from contact with them, and they receive no justice nor honour for any worthy deed. Among all the druids there is one who is the supreme leader, holding highest authority over the rest. When the chief druid dies, whoever is the most worthy succeeds him. If there are several of equal standing, a vote of all the druids follows, though the leadership is sometimes contested even by armed force. At a certain time of the year, all the druids gather together at a consecrated spot in the territory of the Carnutes, whose land is held to be the centre of all Gaul. Everyone gathers there from the whole land to present disputes, and they obey the judgments and decrees of the druids. It is said that the druidic movement began in Britain and was then carried across to Gaul. Even today, those who wish to study their teaching most diligently usually travel to Britain. The druids are exempt from serving in combat and paying war taxes, unlike all other Gauls. Tempted by such advantages, many young people willingly commit themselves to druidic studies, while others are sent by their parents. It is said that in the schools of the druids they learn a great number of verses, so many, in fact, that some students spend twenty years in training. It is not permitted to write down any of these sacred teachings, though other public and private transactions are often recorded in Greek letters. I believe they practice this oral tradition for two reasons. First, so that the common crowd does not gain access to their secrets, and second, to improve the faculty of memory. Truly, writing does often weaken one's diligence in learning, and reduces the ability to memorize. The cardinal teaching of the druids is that the soul does not perish, but after death passes from one body to another. Because of this teaching that death is only a transition, they are able to encourage fearlessness in battle. They have a great many other teachings as well, which they hand down to the young, concerning such things as the motion of the stars, the size of the cosmos and the earth, the order of the natural world, and the power of the immortal gods. All of the Gauls are greatly devoted to religion, and because of this those who are afflicted with terrible illnesses or face dangers in battle will conduct human sacrifices, or at least vow to do so. The Druids are the ministers at such occasions. They believe that unless the life of a person is offered for the life of another, the dignity of the immortal gods will be insulted. This is true both in private and public sacrifices. Some build enormous figures which they fill with living persons and then set on fire, everyone perishing in flames. They believe that the execution of thieves and other criminals is the most pleasing to the gods, but when the supply of guilty persons runs short, they will kill the innocent as well. The chief god of the Gauls is Mercury, and there are images of him everywhere. He is said to be the inventor of all the arts, the guide for every road and journey, and the most influential god in trade and money-making. After him they worship Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, and Minerva. These gods have the same areas of influence as among most other peoples. Apollo drives away diseases. Minerva is most influential in crafts. Jupiter rules the sky and Mars is the god of war. Before a great battle, they will often dedicate the spoils to Mars. If they are successful, they will sacrifice all the living things they have captured and other spoils they gather together in one place. Among many tribes, you can see these spoils placed together in a sacred spot, and it is a very rare occasion that anyone would dare to disturb these valuable goods and conceal them in his home. If it does happen, the perpetrator is tortured and punished in the worst ways imaginable. The Gauls all say that they are descended from the god of the dark underworld, Dis, and confirm that this is the teaching of the Druids. Because of this, they measure time by the passing of nights, not days. Birthdays and the beginnings of months and years all start at night. The funerals of the Gauls are magnificent and extravagant. Everything which was dear to the departed is thrown into the fire, including animals. In the recent past, they would also burn faithful slaves and beloved subordinates at the climax of the funeral. Caesar, while writing something of a puff piece in notebooks, certainly had first-hand knowledge of the Druids from his time fighting the Gauls, and was thus an invaluable direct observer. While probably writing from second-hand sources, Strabo gave a similar description of the Druids' high status in his seminal geography which was published in the first decade of the first century BC, before Caesar's work. Among all the Gallic peoples, generally speaking, there are three sets of men who are held in exceptional honour. The Bards, 
the Vates and the Druids, the Bards as singers and poets, the Vates diviners and natural philosophers, while the Druids, in addition to natural philosophy, study also moral philosophy. Caesar's observation that the Druids acted like judges for social disputes was also echoed by Strabo, who wrote, The Druids are considered the most just of men, and on this account they are entrusted with the decision not only of the private disputes, but of the public disputes as well, so that in former times they even arbitrated cases of war and made the opponents stop when they were about to line up for battle, and the murder cases in particular had been turned over to them for decision. Further, when there is a big yield from these cases, there is forthcoming a big yield from the land too, as they think. Strabo also seems to confirm Caesar's description of the Druids' religious beliefs about the immortality of the soul. However, not only the Druids, but others as well, say that men's souls, and also the universe, are indestructible, although both fire and water will at some time or other prevail over them. While these theological points may have been of some interest to the Romans, one area of religious practice that always intrigued ancient writers was divination, the ability to tell the future or of far-off events. The famous Roman orator and philosopher Cicero described the Druids, among the religious practitioners of several foreign peoples, in his work De Divination, of Divination, he wrote in approximately 44 BC, nor is the practice of divination disregarded even among uncivilized tribes. If indeed there are druids in Gaul, and there are, for I know one of them myself, Divitiarchus the Aeduan, your guest and eulogist. He claimed to have that knowledge of nature which the Greeks called physiologia, and he used to make predictions, sometimes by means of augury and sometimes by means of conjecture. Strabo also mentioned druidic divination. They used to strike a human being, whom they had devoted to death, in the back with a sabre, and then divine from his death struggle. But they were not sacrificed without the druids. Diodorus Siculus described druidic rituals surrounding divination at length. The Gauls have certain wise men and experts on the gods called druids, as well as a highly respected class of seers. Through auguries and animal sacrifice, these seers predict the future, and no one dares to scoff at them. They have an especially odd and unbelievable method of divination for the most important matters. Having anointed a human victim, they stab him with a small knife in the area above the diaphragm. When the man has collapsed from the wound, they interpret the future by observing the nature of his fall, the convulsion of his limbs, and especially from the pattern of his spurting blood. In this type of divination, the seers place great trust in an ancient tradition of observation. It is a custom among the Gauls to never perform a sacrifice without someone skilled in divine ways present. They say that those who know about the nature of the gods should offer thanks to them, and make requests of them as though these people spoke the same language as the gods. The Gauls, friends and foes alike, obey the rule of the priests and bards not only in time of peace, but also during wars. It has often happened that just as two armies approached each other with swords drawn and spears ready, the druids will step between the two sides and stop the fighting as if they had cast a spell on wild beasts. Thus even among the wildest barbarians anger yields to wisdom, and the god of war respects the muses. It is in keeping with their wildness and savage nature that they carry out particularly offensive religious practices. They will keep some criminal under guard for five years, then impale him on a pole in honour of their gods, followed by burning him on an enormous pyre along with many other first fruits. They also use prisoners of war as sacrifices to the gods. Some of the Gauls will even sacrifice animals captured in war, either by slaying them, burning them, or by killing them with some other type of torture. A better known account of the divinatory and magical practices comes from the Natural History by Pliny the Elder, who mentions the Druids in his chapter on mistletoe. He noted, I can't forget to mention the admiration the Gauls have for mistletoe. The Druids, which is the name of their holy men, hold nothing more sacred than this plant and the tree on which it grows, as if it grew only on oaks. They worship only in oak groves, and will perform no sacred rites unless a branch of that tree is present. It seems the Druids even get their name from Drus, the Greek word for oak, 
and indeed they think that anything which grows on an oak tree is sent from above, and is a sign that the tree was selected by the god himself. The problem is that, in fact, mistletoe rarely grows on oak trees. Still, they search it out with great diligence, and then will cut it only on the sixth day of the moon's cycle, because the moon is then growing in power but is not yet halfway through its course. They use the moon to measure not only months but years, and their grand cycle of thirty years. In their language they call mistletoe a name meaning all healing. They held sacrifices and sacred meals under oak trees, first leading forward two white bulls with horns bound for the first time. A priest dressed in white then climbs the tree and cuts the mistletoe with a golden sickle, with the plant dropping it onto a white cloak. They then sacrifice the bulls while praying that the god will favorably grant his own gift to those whom he has given it. They believe a drink made with mistletoe will restore fertility to barren livestock and act as a remedy to all poisons. Such is the devotion to frivolous affairs shown by many people. Similar to the Sabine herb, Savin is a plant called Selago. It must be picked without an iron instrument by passing the right hand through the opening of the left sleeve as if you were stealing it. The harvester, having first offered bread and wine, must wear white and have clean bare feet. It is carried in a new piece of cloth. The druids of Gaul say that it should be used to ward off every danger, and that the smoke of burning salago is good for eye disorders. The druids also gather a plant from marshes called samolus, which must be picked with the left hand during a time of fasting. It is good for the diseases of cows, but the one who gathers it must not look back, nor place it anywhere except in the watering trough of the animals. There is a kind of egg which is very famous in Gaul, but ignored by Greek writers. In the summer months, a vast number of snakes will gather themselves together in a ball, which is held together by their saliva and a secretion from their bodies. The druids say they produce this egg-like object called an anguinum, which the hissing snakes throw up into the air. It must be caught, so they say, in a cloak before it hits the ground. But you'd better have a horse handy, because the snakes will chase you until they are cut off by some stream. A genuine anguinum will float upstream, even if covered in gold. But, as is common with the world's holy men, the druids say it can only be gathered during a particular phase of the moon, as if people could make the moon and serpents work together. I saw one of these eggs myself. It was a small, round thing, like an apple, with a hard surface, full of indentations, as on the arms of an octopus. The druids value them highly. They say it is a great help in lawsuits, and will help you gain the good will of a ruler. That this is plainly false is shown by a man of the Gaulish Vaconti tribe, a Roman knight who kept one hidden in his cloak during a trial before the emperor Claudius, and was executed, as far as I can tell, for this reason alone. Barbarous rites were found in Gaul even within my own memory, for it was then that the emperor Tiberius passed a decree through the senate outlawing the druids and these types of diviners and physicians. But why do I mention this about a practice which has crossed the sea and reached the ends of the earth? For even today Britain performs rites with such ceremony that you would think that they were the source for the extravagant Persians. It is amazing how distant people are so similar in such practices. But at least we can be glad that the Romans have wiped out the murderous cult of the Druids, who thought human sacrifice and ritual cannibalism were the greatest kind of piety. In this expert, Pliny offers perhaps the richest detail of all the ancient sources. His account includes details of Druidic ritual, the use of oak groves, the importance of mistletoe, that were not noted anywhere else, and it's perhaps no coincidence that worship in oaken groves was not unique to the Druids as there is evidence that the Germanic god Thor, Donar, was worshipped primarily in this context as well. Perhaps, most importantly, Pliny provides an evocative image that has influenced all later images of the Druids, a white-robed priest with a golden sickle climbing an oak tree to harvest mistletoe, while two white bulls bellow on the floor of the grove below. He also notes that the Druids used a lunar calendar that began their months on the fifth day of the lunar cycle, and was divided up into months, years, and ages. The Romans, on the other hand, used a solar calendar that they dated back to the founding of their city, the calendar of Romulus, and the revised form of that calendar is still used across the West today. 
The existence of a calendar is itself a tribute to the druid's learning, and their ability to not only carefully track celestial motions, but also perform relatively complex mathematics. The fact that they apparently did so without writing is even more impressive, though not unique as the civilizations of the Andes also created elaborate calendars without writing. The famous Roman historian Livy wrote of a grisly anecdote in the first century AD about Celtic sacrifice. Posthumius died there, fighting with all his might not to be captured alive. The Gauls stripped him of all his spoils, and the boy took his severed head in a procession to the holiest of their temples. There it was cleaned, and the bear skull was adorned with gold, as is their custom. It was used thereafter as a sacred vessel on special occasions, and as a ritual drinking cup by their priests and temple officials. The Romans' grim accounts of human sacrifice were clearly designed to chill the hearts of Roman readers, and scholars may have taken them with a grain of salt, except for the fact that they were later confirmed by archaeological evidence. In total, these written accounts all create a rough outline of the Druids that seems to describe a pan-Celtic order of priests and political functionaries who performed rituals in oak groves using mistletoe. These accounts also suggest the Druids were central to sacred sacrifices, were keepers of a vast body of knowledge including a calendar through memorization, especially the theological concept of metempsychosis, the undeath of the soul and reincarnation. Druids also apparently served as neutral arbiters and diplomats for the fractious Celtic chiefdoms. The ancient accounts are supported by the weak linguistic evidence that interprets the word druid as originating from the term meaning those who know the oak and truth in Old Celtic. One of the most important observations that emerges from the Roman accounts is that the druids had two distinct roles within society making it all but impossible to completely understand their position among the ancient Celts. On the one hand, they were teachers, ritual leaders and scholars keeping secret law. This side is widely recognized in modern writings on the organization. However, the other side of the coin is that the Druids were the diplomats, arbiters and judges of their society, helping to keep the often precarious balance of power and peace between rival chiefdoms and factions in what must have been a complex political environment across ancient Gaul, Britain, and Ireland. While this is enough information to spark the imaginations of generations, it is still only a taste compared to the apparent spiritual and political richness of the Druidic orders. If we want to move beyond this basic outline, we will need to turn to other non-written records. Our next section does just that, examining the archaeological record left behind by the Druids and their communities, the Celts. Chapter 3 The Archaeological Record Given that the Romans were hostile toward them, scholars have long questioned the veracity of what the Romans wrote about the Druids, and the sketchiness of Roman descriptions have led those interested in the ancient Celtic religion to increasingly turn to the archaeological record, despite difficulties associated with interpreting this type of evidence. Archaeologists face a challenge when searching for evidence about the beliefs and practices of the Druids. Since they are only able to excavate the physical remains of a society, it is easy for them to learn about topics like diet, home construction, fortifications, and tool use, which all leave easily discoverable traces in the earth. However, it is quite a bit more difficult extrapolating out social systems like economics and politics from these physical remains. Similarly, for primarily mental phenomena like religion or philosophy, there are little remains for ephemeral performances like dance, music, or ritual. This would be true of any religion, but the ancient writers noted that the Druids practiced their religion in forest groves and strictly kept no written records. As a result, scholars use two of the main types of historic material typically used for understanding past religions, sacred architecture and sacred texts. Luckily, there are two other areas that can provide us with some insight. The first is research into Celtic social structure, and the second is an analysis of surviving Celtic art, especially objects and the bodies of sacrificed individuals associated with religious rites. Archaeologists have been able to trace the Celts' transition from Urnfielder to Latin, 
and the fact that it involved a slow increase in population density and an accompanying increase in the size of settlements and the level of social complexity. During the Hellstedt period, these early Celts began to trade with Mediterranean societies, Greeks and then Romans, which brought in quantities of prestigious luxury goods and over time a class of chieftains arose amongst the Celts, utilizing growing conflicts over resources like agricultural land and trade routes, and employing high-status import goods to demonstrate their right to rule. These chieftains became a fixture in Celtic life in the Latin period, and they led the resistance to Roman conquest. The archaeological record, with its wealth of information about hill forts, weapons, increased demands on the land and trade routes, gives us a relatively good understanding of the military and political dynamics of these chieftains. The Romans noted the existence of these chieftains, who Caesar referred to as knights, but it is important to note that Caesar described them as only one of two ruling classes in Celtic society, the other being the Druids. The form of government that the chiefs provided was fundamentally unstable in nature, because their positions were not typically inherited, but instead built up over the lifetime of the individual through military victories and the gathering of allies and vassals. The chiefdom was a relatively small polity, as the chief had to maintain personal relationships with underlings in all of the villages and areas he controlled and when the chief eventually died, the political entity he created rarely survived his death, often leading to conflict amongst surviving underlings vying for control over the largest portions of the former domain. The druids seem to have served as a balancing force by operating as intermediaries between various chiefdoms, and this is probably what Strabo was discussing when he said the druids are entrusted with the decision not only of the private disputes but of the public disputes as well, to the point that they even arbitrated cases of war and made the opponents stop when they were about to line up for battle. This role, along with their position as the trusted keepers of wisdom, history, and law, likely ensured that the druids probably served as a pan-Celtic unifying force in an ever-shifting political landscape. Indeed, there are examples of warring tribal peoples in recent history who share a cultural tradition with institutions like the Druids that can serve to minimize violence within the group. For example, among the Sudanese Nua people in the 1930s, leopard-skinned chiefs moved between rival villages, negotiating settlements for crimes and cooling hot heads. However, when the Nur went to war with their neighbors, the Dinka, there was no such institution, and the wars were often much bloodier. One of the debates about the Druids where archaeologists have provided useful information is the question of human sacrifice. The ancient Roman writers noted the Celts' penchant for this type of sacrifice, which they saw as a barbaric practice, but it was far from unknown in the region. For instance, the biblical story of Abraham's aborted sacrifice of his son Isaac only makes sense in a context where gods could demand the offering of human lives. Furthermore, it obviously wasn't the gore and blood that the Romans found distasteful, given that they were notorious for loving violent spectacles like gladiatorial games. Instead, it seems the Romans were disgusted by the role of human sacrifice in religious worship. And, sure enough, there is a growing amount of archaeological evidence supporting the ancient texts describing druids making human offerings. Over time, the bodies of offering victims have been found, the most dramatic of which are the bog men who sometimes turn up in British swamps. One of the best examples is the Lindau man, who had the torso of an otherwise healthy man from the Celtic or early Roman period in northwest England. He was strangled, his head was beaten in, and his throat was cut before he was deposited in the swamp, all of which bears the hallmarks of a ritual killing. It is even possible that he was a willing participant in the ritual, since the ancient writers claimed the Druids taught Celts that the soul was eternal, and that another life awaited them. It cannot be proven exactly who killed Lindau Man, but it is telling that these rituals did seem to take place in the same areas, during the same time periods as the Romans described them and attributed them to the Druids. Another area of archaeological interest is in the surviving artworks. The Latin Celtic peoples are renowned throughout the historical and artistic world for their stunningly beautiful objects, 
and one of the finest collections of Latin objects that have been associated with Druidic rites is at the British Museum in London. Some of these were associated with sacrifices. For instance, a set of decorative bronze spoons were found in a peat bog, akin to the one where Lindo Man was found in Westmoreland County in the northwest of England. A similar spoon was found in a bog near London, and all three spoons had small holes bored near their rims, perhaps for a forgotten ritual purpose. Another British museum piece with a purported connection to the Druids is an iron headband from roughly 200 to 150 BC, akin to a crown and decorated in traditional Latin patterns that was worn directly against the hair. Archaeologists debate over its use, but currently it is believed to have been worn by a religious leader, because it is similar to those described as worn by religious practitioners in Roman Britain a few hundred years later. At the same time, its owner was also buried with an impressive set of weaponry, indicating that perhaps the Druids may have been warrior priests. Roman reports of Druids battling each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat over the position of chief Druid seems to be a nod in that direction. The Latin people are famous for their aesthetic designs, especially their incredible swirling designs, knotwork, spindly animals and spirals, all of which continue to inspire Celtic art to this day. This style built upon traditional Hellstatt styles, but also fused them with elements brought in along trade routes from the classical Mediterranean societies, and added new innovations. It is difficult to say exactly what was the relationship between this aesthetic and the religious beliefs of the Druids, but Latin designs appear on the spoons and headband described above. It is possible that the omnipresent spirals reflected the conception of an endless world in a continuous cycle of eternal rebirth. Overall, the picture we gained from the textual and linguistic evidence is further supported by this archaeological picture. The hard evidence helps with the understanding of the often obscured political role that the Druids played in the petty kingdoms and chiefdoms of the Celtic world. Archaeology is good at piecing together the political and economic lives of deceased peoples, and in the Celtic context it gives a picture of a warrior society, in which the Druids appear to have a key role. The theological evidence also supports the notion of a white-robed Druid with spiral artworks in hammered iron, copper, and gold tools that apparently had religious purpose. Furthermore, scholars can tentatively piece together details about the Druids' ritual practice, which apparently involve mysterious pairs of pierced, ornately decorated spoons, and the violent deaths of sacrificial victims, and the dumping of bodies in bogs. The evidence paints a picture of the Druidic order at its height, during the times when the greatest chieftains of the Gauls threatened Rome, and even sacked the capital at one point. This was a time when the Druids were arguably one of the most powerful political and religious forces in Europe, but this era would not last forever. Chapter 4 The Last Survivors Most of the Roman writers who mentioned the Druids, including Caesar, Cicero, Livy, and Pliny the Elder, all did so in the context of Gaul, but the Druidic tradition extended beyond the main continent and was common throughout Celtic Britain and Ireland as well. Most importantly, it lasted far longer in these regions as well, because these lands were subjected to fewer foreign conquests than Western Europe. In Gaul, the Druids' position was permanently weakened by the loss of their political power once the Romans subjugated the area and added it to the empire. Suetonius made it sound like stamping out the Celts was practically a moral imperative for the Romans. Writing in the middle of the first century AD, Claudius destroyed the horrible and inhuman religion of the Gaulish Druids, which had merely been forbidden to Roman citizens under Augustus. Eventually, as the area was absorbed into the Roman Empire and forced to assimilate Roman religious institutions, the Druids were driven underground. Even still, the Roman Emperor Aurelian consulted Druids in the late 3rd century AD, as noted in Aurelianus. On certain occasions, Aurelian would consult Gaulish Druidesses to discover whether or not his descendants would continue to rule. They told him that no name would be more famous than those of the line of Claudius, and indeed the current emperor Constantius is a descendant of his. 
The Druids appear in an excerpt from the famous Annals by Tacitus, one of Rome's most important historians. In the Annals, Tacitus writes about the 61 AD assault on the island of Mona, probably today's Anglesey off the northwest coast of Wales. This has been referred to by modern authors as the last stand of the Druids. As the Roman troops arrived on the island, they were greeted by an impressive display, including Druids. Tacitus wrote, On the beach stood an adverse array, a serried mass of arms and men, with women flitting between the ranks. In the style of the Furies, in robes of deathly black and with disheveled hair, they brandished their torches. While a circle of druids, lifting their hands to heaven and showering imprecations, struck the troops with such an awe at the extraordinary spectacle that, as though their limbs were paralyzed, they exposed their bodies to wounds without an attempt at movement. Then, reassured by their general and inciting each other never to flinch before a band of females and fanatics, they charged behind the standards, cut down all who met them, and enveloped the enemy in his own flames. The next step was to install a garrison among the conquered population and to demolish the groves consecrated to their savage cults, for they considered it a duty to consult their deities by means of human entrails. While he was thus occupied, the sudden revolt of the province was announced to Suetonius. Despite this victory, Roman power in the region was short-lived, and in those areas of Britain that did not fall under Roman rule, especially Wales, the Druidic tradition appears to have actually lasted far longer than it did anywhere else. Caesar described the Druids as part of a tripartite division of intellectual labor, with diviners, vates, and bards making up the other two legs of the tripod. Bards were singers and extemporaneous poets who performed in the courts of the rulers, and even after the Christianization of Wales, the Bardic tradition continued in the independent courts of the Welsh princes. As late as the 10th century AD, a Welsh ruler named Haldar, Howell the Good, drew up a document in Welsh listing the laws, duties, and privileges of the Bards, and all evidence points to them having taken up the political, if not religious, roles of the Druids including moving between royal courts, interpreting laws, negotiating peace, and, in their role as genealogists, arbitrating on inheritance. Similar institutions existed in pre-colonization Ireland and the Gaelic-speaking areas of the Scottish Highlands as well. One of the most crucial characteristics of the social world of the early Celts that was hard to understand for Romans and even people today was the limit on freedom of movement. The division of the landscape into tiny rival political units meant that both average people and their leaders often could not travel far from their homes without entering the territories of enemies who might kill them on sight. This was not unique to the Celts, but in contrast to this lack of mobility, the early modern bards of the Welsh and Irish statelets possessed a tremendous social power. Mobility. This social power was probably inherited directly from the Druids of antiquity, reinforcing the view that Druids were not only religious leaders, but fundamentally political figures as well. This was not unique, since the fusion of political and religious roles was common throughout the ancient world, and remains institutionalized in religious monarchies today, like Saudi Arabia. Given that the Druids had a dual religious and political nature, it's no surprise that their decline was linked to changes in both of these dimensions. In Gaul, the change was brought about by political upheaval, while in Wales and Ireland it was first religious, with the introduction of Christianity, and then political. Ultimately, it was not until the final conquest of Ireland, Wales, and the Scottish Highlands and their integration into the British state that the last remnants of the Druidic political tradition were extinguished. Chapter 5. The Druids' Connection to Ancient Celtic Myths and Legends there are writings from much later Christian monks, primarily in Ireland and Wales, who wrote down the mythology and folklore of their peoples. However, these stories cannot be taken as pure transfers of Druidic knowledge because the Druids wrote nothing down, despite being aware of the existence of writing through their contacts with the Mediterranean. It is possible, if not likely, that some Druidic knowledge, especially secret interpretations of myth, was not widely disseminated, and over time stories morphed after their decline. 
Moreover, the common folk and the priesthood practiced widely different forms of religion, and told widely differing tales, all of which could be warped by Christian chroniclers. Again, this is not unique. Recent research in southern India, a region of the world with beliefs in polytheism and reincarnation taught by a hereditary priesthood much like the Druids, has shown that the practices of low-caste Hindus often diverge widely from the Brahmanic orthodoxy to the point of contradicting it at times. Despite those caveats, it's certainly worth reading and analysing Irish and Welsh mythology, both of which include a division between tales about the creation and nature of the world, the actions of the gods, the actions of semi-divine heroes, and the actions of humans. One element of these tales is the repeated destruction and repopulation of the land. In Ireland, the Book of Conquests tells how Ireland was repeatedly conquered by various peoples. For example, the first inhabitants were the Partholons, who were defeated by the Fomorians. The Fomorians were attacked by the Nemeds, who were defeated and enslaved. But then the third wave of invasion were the Fairbolg, who conquered the Fomorians. They were in turn conquered by the Tuatha de Danann, both the race of conquerors and simultaneously the race of Irish pagan gods. They were then conquered by the Milesians, the ancestors of the modern Irish, and were driven underground. This cyclical conquest was eventually integrated into Christian myths about the Great Flood, but in essence it reflects a pre-Christian concept of the cyclical ages of the earth, a belief that appears to be tied to the druidic teachings about the eternal, yet cyclical nature of both human souls and the earth itself. Another area of interest lies in the tales of Celtic heroes. Examples include the great Cuchulain and Fionn Mac Cumhail, Finn McCool in English, in the Irish-Scottish myths, and Bredery or Arthur in Welsh tales. Though they were humans, these figures often have supernatural power, and achieve tremendous feats of strength, courage, and martial prowess by pushing back the monstrous forces at the edge of Celtic society and protecting the whole. Roman writers like Caesar and Tacitus marvelled at the Celts' bravery in battle, and at least partially attributed it to the Druids' teachings about reincarnation of the soul. Perhaps these tales of great heroes provided an extra wrinkle by giving examples of heroic deeds of men who disregarded their own safety, and who gained a semblance of eternal life through the fame of their deeds. The tale of Arthur itself has a built-in element of reincarnation, even in the much later Christian retellings with the belief that he is the once and future king who awaits Britain's time of greatest need to return to his people. While the mythology is colourful, it does not give much insight into how the Druidic religious establishment operated, or how the rituals it performed looked. This should not be a surprise, because nobody could reconstruct a Catholic Mass simply by reading the Bible. But what the study of mythology allows is a glimpse into the imaginative world that gave meaning to the ritual. It certainly says something about the Celtic world that its great heroes were not prophets speaking the word of God or gods to a straying community of faithful, but were instead warriors who carved safety for the faithful out through feats of bravado. It perhaps helps people understand why the Druids may have chosen their own leaders through trial by combat, and why they were apparently more than willing to sacrifice the blood of their warriors both in ritual and on the battlefield. In the same vein, the tales about repeated destruction and recreation were like a Latin spiral, curling outwards from its point of origin and never necessarily repeating its path exactly, but passing over the same ground over and over again. Beyond these interpretations, it is difficult to extrapolate much more out of the connection between myth and practice. There have been, however, heroic efforts to attempt just that. An example is Robert Graves' The White Goddess, 1948, which aimed to create a historical grammar of poetic myth by reconstructing the meaning of pan-European pre-Christian mythology including intensive examination of druidic beliefs extrapolated from existing myths. In time, the lack of knowledge gave rise to the ability of people to fill in the practices and beliefs, and for centuries the peoples of Britain have marveled at the incredible megalithic stone monuments that dot their land. While the most famous of these is obviously Stonehenge, there are hundreds of others, 
ranging from similar large stone circles like the Avebury Circle in Wiltshire or the Ring of Brodegar on Orkney, to single solitary stones like Cornwall's Menantol, to tombs like those in Ireland's Boyne Valley. Folklore traditionally assigned construction of these henges to the devil or figures like Merlin, or people interpreted them as frozen dancers punished for ancient sins. However, in the late 18th century, antiquarian scholars across Britain began to argue that these stones could be attributed to the Druids. These men sought to understand the history of Britain not according to medieval fantasies of pixies and the devil, but instead to fit it into the broad sweep of recorded history, which was intimately connected to the writings of classical authors. The arrival of a scientific, methodical approach to British history charted a parallel interest in both megaliths like Stonehenge and the Druids. One of the first individuals to do so was John Aubrey, whose magnum opus Monumenta Britannica attempted to catalogue the stone monuments of southern Britain. In it, he described Stonehenge in great detail, including noting the holes where the ancient wooden posts had once been located, now called Aubrey Holes in his honour, and attempting to link the site up with existing textual evidence. This led him to connect the site with the Druids described by Roman chroniclers, a connection that current scholars have refuted. Nevertheless, Aubrey's work was an important step in making people look at Stonehenge as a site of scientific and historical significance, not simply one for folklore and romance. After Aubrey, the next major archaeologist to work on the site was William Stukeley, who bridged the works of archaeology and neo-Druidry. For Stukeley, an Anglican priest, there was no doubt the Druids had built the site, and he and his contemporaries like Iolo Morganwy in Wales attempted to reconstruct this ancient, authentic British religious tradition, which he believed was itself part of an ancient, universal religion. Stukeley, however, was important in the field of archaeology too, since he was the first to scientifically attempt to date the site, using now disproved theories about the migration of the magnetic poles. Despite using flawed science, Stukeley was the first to recognize the site's celestial alignment, and he even began tentative steps at excavation, opening a grave he described as belonging to a warrior princess. Stukeley's major work on the site was entitled Stonehenge, a Temple Restored to the British Druids, 1740. By the 19th century, the Stones and the Druids were fundamentally linked in the romantic imagination of the time period, as seen in artistic works like Stonehenge by John Constable, 1820, and eventually modern neo-pagan druidic rituals came to be set in standing stones, such as the annual summer solstice rites at Stonehenge. The idea that Stonehenge and its sister standing stones were the temples of the Druids is an appealing one, especially for 19th and 20th century Britons looking for an authentically British form of spirituality. Since these sites were easily the most impressive examples of British antique architecture, it made sense to people that they might be temples of Britain's most famous ancient priesthood. Unfortunately for them, that belief has no firm evidence supporting it. One clear fact is that none of the cultures identified today as ancient Celts built Stonehenge or the other megaliths that dot northwestern Europe. In fact, the cultures that created these sites appear to predate the arrival of the Celtic peoples in the region by thousands of years. Moreover, the Roman observers did not leave any record of a connection between the Druids and the Stones, Instead, they explicitly described both Gaulish and British Druids as practising in groves, with Pliny clarifying that they were oak groves laden with mistletoe. Does this mean that the Druids most definitely did not utilise the standing stones? It does not completely rule out the possibility. Certainly they were aware of them, as no community living in the areas around a stone circle has ever been ignorant of their presence. It is possible that the Druids had a relationship to the stones even if they didn't use them for rituals, such as telling stories about the origins and purposes of the henges. It's altogether possible that the Druids were just as fascinated by sites like Stonehenge as people are today, and they may have offered just as many theories to explain their existence. Chapter 6. A Modern Revival 
Due to the relative paucity of evidence about exactly what the Druids practiced and believed, discussions of the history of the Order almost inevitably turn to speculation. While some historical dots can be connected to concrete evidence, there are plenty of gaping holes to fill, and by the 18th century, Druidic enthusiasts have been doing just that. In fact, people have attempted to recreate the entire corpus of Druidic sacred ritual, lore, and mythology. Stonehenge and stone monuments like it around Britain have been linked in the minds of the people of Britain with the Druids since the writings of the 18th century archaeologist William Stukeley. Stukeley, however, did not act alone. Around Britain, upper-class, often Anglican Britons were at this time seeking to understand the ancient Celtic religions of their islands. For many, the Druids held a great attraction, and the people began to form Druidic orders around the writings of scholars like Stukeley and Eolo Morganwy, 1747-1826. Morganwy, a Welsh nationalist, claimed to have found documents detailing druidic rituals, and even though it is now known that he faked the original documents, his ceremonials have had a deep impact upon the modern druidic movement. A variation of his ritual is still performed yearly at Stonehenge. Working at roughly the same time as Morganwy was another famous Celtic forger named James Macpherson. Macpherson also tapped into a European craze for ancient texts and poems, and in 1761 he published what he claimed was a transcription of ancient Gaelic poems, entitled Fingal, an ancient epic poem in six books, together with several other poems by Ossian, son of Fingal. While the works by Macpherson and Morganwy were different, Ossian is an epic poem, while Morganwy's forgeries were collections of smaller works. Both share a fascination with poets. The titular Ossician was a bard and the son of the famous warrior Finn McCool, and Morganwy attributed many of his works to the famous Welsh poet Taliesin. This emphasis on poetry as central to Celtic thought and spirituality would infuse all later interpretations of Druidic ritual. Perhaps ironically, Morganwy's forgeries were of such quality, not only in appearance to be ancient, but in their literary and religious value, that they have gained a legitimacy of their own and continue to have a life within the religious and cultural communities of neo-Druids to this very day. For example, Morganwy created six versions of a sacred text he called Druid's Prayer, which continues to be central to Druidic rite today and here is a version used by the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. Grant, O Holy Ones, thy protection, and in protection, strength, and in strength, understanding, and in understanding, knowledge, and in knowledge, the knowledge of justice, and in the knowledge of justice, the love of it, and in that love, the love of all existences, and in the love of all existences, the love of earth, our mother, and all goodness. In Morganwy's understanding of the Druidic faith, the Druids were closely connected to the practice of poetry, and had developed an elaborate system of poetic metrics. The order itself was monotheistic, and dedicated to the worship of God through his most important manifestation, the sun. Hence, Morganwy created a calendar of worship of the sun through its annual cycle, and saw the light of that celestial body as representing both the grace of God and the inspiration for poetry, both of which he depicted through an emblem called the Awen, which is three rays descending outwards from a single point. Morganwy was a Unitarian Christian, and he ultimately came to believe that the Druids were themselves proto-Christians, worshipping the same deity he did. Morganwy eventually moved to London and founded a modern Druidic order, leading a group of robed priests in the worship of the sun on Primrose Hill in Regent's Park. He would later suggest that future rites should occur in standing stone circles. The modern Druidic movement has bifurcated into two branches. The one most associated with Morganwy is the Gossadau, which are ceremonial institutions in Wales, Cornwall, and the continental region of Brittany that aim to promote their local Celtic cultures and languages, Welsh, Cornish, and Breton, respectively, within the context of yearly rituals and award ceremony. 
The events are something of a mix of a Masonic ceremony, the Celtic Oscars, and the Queen's yearly nomination of knighthoods, and these ceremonies are traditionally associated strongly with stone circles. For example, the first Cornish Gorsed, the single of Gorsedare, was held in 1928 in the stone circle of Boscowan Un, and the much larger Welsh Gorseth now uses custom-built stone circles for its events. Morganwy's rituals consciously integrated the circles, making them sacred ground which only the members of the Gorsed, the initiated bards, Ovates and Druids could enter. While Stonehenge was perhaps the model that Morganwy had in mind in the 1780s, it is not located within a traditional Celtic country, but directly within the thoroughly English countryside of Wiltshire, and thus it has never been the site of a nationalist Gorsed ceremony. Instead, it has been adopted by the other strand of the Druidic tradition, the religious neo-pagans. For these individuals, the Celtic languages are not crucial. Instead, they seek to reconstruct the ancient pre-Christian sun-worshipping religion of the islands. Druidism in this form is a highly dualistic religion, contrasting the male sun with the female moon, rationality with irrationality, light with dark. The ceremony performed yearly in Stonehenge at the solstice is done by the Glastonbury Order of Druids and their political wing, the Loyal Arthurian Warband. The members of the order dress in ritual robes and process into the circle. They perform a ritual based upon Morganwy's original. They enter the sacred circle and call to the four cardinal directions, blowing a ram's horn and chanting the ritual question, Is there peace? The ritual then involves the invocation of the Druid's prayer, written by Morganwy and used by both Gorsedow and Neo-Druids, and the prayers and ceremonial continues until the climax, the rising of the sun over the heelstone. The Druids perform a second rite at noon, and then the sacred circle is opened, which means the non-initiated public is allowed in. Since the time of the free festivals, members of the New Age traveller community enter and perform marriages and baby-naming ceremonies, scatter the ashes of their dead, and generally commune with the stones and one another. This ritual tradition and the accompanying yearly crowds of spectators was mostly unchanged throughout the first seventy years of the twentieth century. However, by the 1970s there was a growing interest in the site amongst those involved in alternative New Age religions, and many saw it as the paragon of ancient holy places. These people, many of them branded hippies by the press, began to also arrive at Stonehenge starting in the mid-1970s and started a new tradition, the Stonehenge Free Festival. Morganwy's groups, which aim to achieve spiritual enlightenment, predated the primary strand of modern neo-paganism, which is Wiccanism or witchcraft. Originally, like Morganwy, these groups saw themselves as sun worshippers and considered themselves Christians. In fact, Christian ministers were at times members of these organizations. But in the 1950s, this began to change. One force-pushing change was the emergence of goddess-worshipping Wiccans, after Gerald Gardner published Witchcraft Today in 1954, and the second was the evolution of Druidic thought after the 1948 publication of The White Goddess by Robert Graves, who saw the Druids as goddess worshippers themselves. Since that time, many of the Druidic groups have come to view themselves as either goddess worshippers or as worshipping a male sun deity that exists in parallel to a female moon deity. Others argue that Druidry is not a religion per se, but instead a spiritual practice, like meditation that does not require belief in a specific deity, and therefore can be embraced by both Christians and pagans. Today, Druids are often better organized than most pagan groups, with relatively strict hierarchies that attempt to emulate the descriptions of Druidic organizations in the ancient texts. For many of these groups, the fact that Morganwy forged a lot of his documents does not undermine the ultimate spiritual truth of what he wrote. Furthermore, they are often not strict reconstructionists like historical reenactors, but instead are willing to practice a faith that has a connection to the past, but does not claim to be a perfect reconstruction of a past religion. Most modern Druidic groups fill in the broad gaps in the historical record through recourse to divine inspiration, often through the use of Native American-inspired sweat lodges, or through the interpretation of dreams, 
sometimes in the light of psychoanalytical theories like Jung's archetypes. The Gorsed Eisteddfod tradition was a product of the 19th century, the same romantic movement that embraced Morganwy and Macpherson, but in the 20th century it began to gain traction outside of Wales. The first expansion was to Brittany, a region of modern France whose native Breton language is a close cousin of Welsh. The Gorsed Breton was founded in 1899 and has a rocky history, in part because of the fact that it always blended a more religious character into its rites than its Welsh counterpart, and also because of its association with the fascist Nazi occupiers during World War II. The third branch, the Gorsed Kernow, is based in Cornwall and was founded in 1928. Cornwall had a Celtic tongue related to Welsh and Breton, and though it ceased to be used in the 19th century, the Gorsed became central to the revival movement of the language. Thus, after centuries hidden in obscurity, Druids have returned to the modern world. Granted, centuries of mystery have not been kind to the details of their memory, so modern people have had to draw upon their own creativity, and even though the revival was a result of forgeries by people like Iolo Morganwy, it continues today. It is now commonplace to find druids being depicted as nature sorcerers and or priests in a number of video games, and the description for one game, Pathfinder, captures the new interpretation well. Within the purity of the elements and the order of the wilds lingers a power beyond the marvels of civilization. Furtive yet undeniable, these primal magics are guarded over by servants of philosophical balance, known as druids. Allies to beasts and manipulators of nature, these often misunderstood protectors of the wild strive to shield their lands from all who would threaten them and prove the might of the wilds to those who lock themselves behind city walls. Obviously, in these cases and in some religious druidic movements dedicated to animal archetypes and sweat lodges, druids have become divorced from the Celts, and instead represent an embodiment of nature worship. This may be the new direction that modern druids will take, moving further and further from the intricacies and politics between Gaulish chiefdoms. This has been The Druids, The History and Mystery of the Ancient Celtic Priests. Written by Charles River Editors, Jesse Harasta. Narrated by Philip J. Mather. Copyright 2012 by Charles River Editors. Production Copyright 2015 by Charles River Editors. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.